by 1912, 1913, you had women engaging in really quite serious violence. So violence such as bombing campaigns, uh, timber yards were blown up, M uh, MPs' homes were attacked, bombs were left on trains and in post offices. So it's really going up another level, which there's some disagreement amongst historians of whether these, this should be referred to as terrorist violence or terrorist activity. But at the time, it certainly caused huge alarm and concern. As a result of the failure of the political parties at that time, and particularly the Liberal or the Conservative Party, to act on these demands to extend the franchise to women, you have increasing frustration developing amongst certain quarters of the wider suffrage movement. By 1910, most MPs in the House of Commons had come around to the idea of women having the parliamentary franchise. They already could vote in local elections, so it was just extending that right to them for national politics. But they couldn't quite figure out how to do it, and they were all worried about if they did extend the vote to women, would the women vote for the other party? So it was about self-preservation. They wanted to stay in power, they wanted to keep their constituencies, and they felt threatened by this unknown other of how women might vote. three members of the Women's Social and Political Union threw a hatchet into the carriage that he was travelling along the street in Dublin. It missed him but nipped the ear of John Redman, the Irish nationalist leader. And then later that night, they didn't give up, they weren't deterred, they were quite determined. <laughs> later that evening, they tried to burn down the theatre that Asquith was attending an event at. And all three received quite long prison sentences as a result of their action. First World War breaks out in 1914 and in, in some strange way it's actually an opportunity for Emmeline Pankhurst to stop the campaign because it really was kind of work, working itself into a dead end of violence. So I think it's important when we're looking back and remembering the history of the suffrage movement that we acknowledge that when social movements are using different forms of protest some of those really can be quite extreme and we can't really hide away from perhaps being a bit uncomfortable with some of the tactics that were used. Um, at, at that time. They couldn't have young men returning from the horrors of the First World War who had served their countries in the ultimate act of self-sacrifice and then not be, have the right to vote. Up to 40% of men didn't have the right to vote in 1914 because they didn't own property, so they didn't meet the property qualifications. And they were very effective in ensuring that in those discussions at Westminster that women would receive the right to vote.
except that there wasn't sing one single story which reflects the suffrage movement. Like all protest movements, it involves a really rich diversity of activists and it's very interesting for us to find out what draw, drew all of these different women together. Um, having one goal is very effective when you're campaigning, so of course it's not surprising that the vote presented that goal to so many women. They saw having access to political citizenship, so having the right to vote, would alleviate some of the everyday difficulties they experienced in their lives. So poor working conditions, low pay, lack of um, health care, all of these issues could be changed and were more likely to be changed, they strongly believed, if you had representation in the Houses of um, Parliament. Once again, when we're remembering the history of this movement, one has to be careful of not suggesting that these were two polarised groups. They all knew each other, they worked together, there was a lot of fluid movement between both suffragettes and suffragists. You could be both. There was nothing saying that you couldn't at one point support suffragist activity and another point uh, be a suffragette.